Make sure your phones are turned off, please. Okay, so welcome to Careers with a Conscience, Working Global Social Responsibility. Um, this is a Talking Trade event. I don't know if you guys have been to one before, but uh, it's co-produced by the International Trade Marketing Department and the Corporate Social Responsibility Club, of which I am the president. Um, so basically, we have some amazing panelists here today. I'm going to introduce them in a few minutes. And um, we're going to have uh, lots of questions, hopefully. We're going to have Julian and Annabelle going around with microphones. We have Julian right here, Annabelle over here. Um, so once we start that up, if you have a question, just signal to them. They'll come to you. Make sure you speak into the microphone like this, <laughs> not like me, um, because we're, we're taping this. So everything's going to be on video. Um, and I do want to thank a few people for um, making this event possible. We've got um, Christine Pomeranz, the chairperson of our department, uh, Professor Guillermo Jimenez, um, the, the club's advisor, and uh, Laura Jones, the ITM advisory board member. We have Mike, Stephanie, and Christian, who are our media team, and um, Roy Larson, who printed our be beautiful uh, brochures. So with further ado, um, I'll introduce our, um, our panelists. I'm not going to do it for very long because they have their stories to tell. So first of all, we have Amy Hall, who is the Director of Social Consciousness at Eileen Fisher. Um, then we have Summer Rain Oaks, who is an eco-model, social entrepreneur, media personality, and many, many other things. Um, Frida Sharif, who is actually stepping in for Nadia Bradshaw. Um, she is the Assistant Manager of Production at Suno. And she manages Suno's you know, factories, fabric mills, and logistics. Then we have Susan McPherson at the end, who is the um, Senior Vice President and Director of Global Marketing and Fenton Communications. So uh, we're looking forward to some, some great conversation. And they're going to introduce themselves a little bit. Um, but first of all, I want to introduce our, do we want to take some pictures? No? OK, never mind. <laughs> oh, come on. So <laughs> we want to say hello. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So. Um, so basically, if you want to just start off, I'm going to introduce Amy. And yeah, no, you can you can just uh, <clears throat> there we go. There we go. You can sit down. Oh, I can't. Well, yeah. I, I like to stand up. Is that okay? Can I do this? Okay. So first, let's make it into a slideshow so it works properly. From beginning. Okay. Good. Oh, good. I like when it shows up. Um, everyone here familiar with Eileen Fisher? Okay. Anyone not familiar with Eileen Fisher? Okay. Cool. So I, I thought it might just be helpful to start with a real quick who we are and how we got where we are today. Um, we are almost 30 years old. We're about to celebrate our 30th anniversary next year, and uh, we're known for our simple shapes like that. We're based here in New York, up on the Hudson River. Um, that's where I'm located, although we do have a big office here in New York City. Our design team, our sales team, merchandising, a couple other teams are here in New York City. Um, but the really cool teams, the ones that really count, are up on the Hudson River in Irvington. So um, that's us. And uh, we produce globally. Uh, one country is missing from that list. I just noticed today, and it's Spain. But um, our primary production is in China, US, and India. Um, and we are uh, about, I don't know, 60 to 70 percent of our production is, of our product is sold in department stores, um, and the rest in our own retail stores um, here, as well as in the UK and Canada. And we're going to achieve $400 million of revenue this year, so that's big. We, we are a growing company. So we are um, an employee-owned company. We're about 31, 32% employee-owned. And for the 10th year in a row, we've been um, uh, designated or awarded um, a, a great place to work um, honor, uh, one of the top 25 best places to work among small and medium-sized companies in the U.S. So we think it's pretty cool. I've been with the company, this is my 20th year, so I've been there a long time and I really love it. And um, here is my team. So I, I work with uh, the social consciousness team. 
Um, when I joined the company, there was no social consciousness team, so the entire, um, all the work of the team, the designation social consciousness, everything has happened um, since I joined the company. And um, we are a growing team. So I put up here just some of the qualities of each of the pers people that works on my team. Social consciousness is responsible for human rights, environmental um, sustainability, and our partnerships with community organizations and women's and girls organizations around the world. And um, what we do as a team is we work with all the other teams in the company to really integrate these values throughout the company. It's not stuff that just happens among the one, two, three, four, five of us. But uh, you know, our design team is committed, our production team is committed, every team has, has a, a role in carrying out these values. And um, we also work externally with a lot of NGOs and other brands to, um, to uh, expand on the work that we do um, as, a as a company. So um, you'll see that we have a wide variety of backgrounds. And it isn't necessarily the case that somebody comes to our team with prior experience doing what they're doing now. We as a company really look for a strong culture fit, values fit. Um, do you have an innate uh, commitment, passion, personal passion for sustainability, um, for social or environmental and or environmental issues? How is that expressed in your personal life? How, is it, how has it been expressed in your professional life? Um, in my case, I mean in our team's case, the skills that we uh, bring to our, our work can be learned. So we really uh, value the cultural fit. Um, and I thought it would just be fun to show you some of the things that we deal with on my team. So we, we talk a lot about whether we, you know, the kinds of fibers we, we want to, um, uh, we're using as a company and what we need to think about and help our designers think about. So we go from um, agricultural choi animal fiber choices to animal fiber choices to um, environmental issues involved in production, human issues involved in production, um, conventional versus artisanal product, which, which you know, what are the issues that we need to be aware of uh, as we produce those, those items. Um, made in China and made in USA are always hot topics for us um, in terms of responding to customer inquiries and in terms of um, addressing uh, greatest need in our supply chain. We have um, washing issues, so once the clothing leaves our hands and ends up in our uh, customer's care, uh, we really are concerned with how they're going to be taking care, of, uh, taking care of those items, so we try to reduce the amount of dry cleaning necessary and increase the hand washing or machine washing. Um, shoes are a relatively recent addition to our portfolio and has opened up a whole new um, bucket of, of uh, concerns for us as a team. Um, we are just now um, engaging in a much, in a huge effort to map our supply chain um, and increase transparency of all our products. So this is again work, work that our team is involved in. Um, we try to influence all teams in the company to approach all of their decision making from a place of values, not just to place uh, cost or quality at the top of the list, but also what are the values that those business partners bring um, or offer, and do they um, match ours as a company? Um, these are some of the organizations that we have recently um, partnered with, Blue Sign, Textile Exchange, Sustainable Parallel Coalition, Social Accountability International, Ethical Trade Initiative Series. These are all partnerships that my team um, manages. And uh, we have a lot of external engagement with our customers and our employees, social media, hang tags, all that stuff. And uh, we're also getting into policy and uh, how we influence um, uh, the greater conversation around sustainability beyond the walls of our company and we have grants and partnerships. So I put this picture in. Um, she doesn't actually know I have her picture in. This is one of my colleagues from our merchandising team. And a few weeks ago, we had an offsite, um, and she was there. Um, and it, it was a sustainability offsite. And we invited a number of people who were involved in um, the conceptualization of a product from, from design all the way to um, 
manufacturing. And she came out of this four-day off-site and said this, um, as a senior merchandiser, I now see the connection of my work to sustainability. I want my daughter to grow up in a better world. And that's the kind of epiphany we want everybody in our company to have. So if they don't come in with it, we want them to get it at some point. So that's the just characterizes what we do. Um, this is a new role that's up on our website right now. We just, um, have, we've been interviewing people for it for the past few days, and it's pretty cool. Um, it's going to be the person that holds on to our supply chain mapping and all of the um, data gathering around all of our product that we need to know about in terms of, um, in order to communicate accurately what's in our product and to know where the risks are and where the opportunities are for uh, deeper partnerships in our supply chain. And this is a new role that will soon go up on our website. So you're seeing it here first. And it's a role that will really push the edges of innovation for us um, in terms of the kind of fabric that we are able to, um, to use. Um, uh, help push us to an even, even greater um, percentage of sustainable fabrics for our, our products. And that is the end of my presentation. I'll, just a little teaser, and I'll be happy to answer questions later. Thanks. Hey there. So again, my name is uh, Summer Rain Oaks, and I think that it's probably best maybe to serve um, the topic of entrepreneurship. So uh, I do not have a presentation, but most recently my business partner and I in 2009 started a company called Source for Style, uh, which is a B2B marketplace, business to business marketplace that connects designers to more sustainable and novel material suppliers around the globe. So something that uh, I had noticed after working within the space anecdotally was talking to a number of designers who weren't able to source materials that were more ecologically or socially sensitive. Oftentimes a designer doesn't know as they kind of get out of the role of school um, that it's not just about going down to, to mood fabrics and picking up some fabric, it's actually sometimes working directly with the textile mills itself. Uh, and we saw that designers are spending up to 85% of their time actually sourcing materials and not designing. So we sought out the opportunity to work with designers as well as suppliers around the world to be able to make those connections happen. Um, I left the company about, uh, I would say a little over a year ago now, so Benita, my business partner, is running it, uh, but I think that there's a vast variety of skill sets that I think that sometimes when you're starting a company or coming into a startup that are needed versus going into a company that has been fully established. Um, most recently and not related to fashion, uh, working with another startup which is called Good Eggs and it's launching in Brooklyn and it's connecting customers directly with farmers and food maker food makers in the US or in the in New York and Brooklyn area so it gives customers the opportunity to um, get farm to fridge products delivered to their door um, one of the things that I think that assets that are needed at when you're coming into a startup is that you work incredibly late hours and I'm not saying that it's something that you don't do in an established com company, but when I mean late hours, I mean you might start at 8 a.m. and you're not finishing until like 3 a.m. <laughs> um, in running Source for Style, it was sometimes we were pushing 100 hour work weeks. And, um, and it's not, it's, it's expected and you, you do it because you're exceptionally passionate about the project and because there's no one else to be able to, to run it but yourselves. Um, so it's, it's just one of the things that I would like open up to people that if you're interested in starting your company, um, whether you're a designer and starting your new design label, uh, it is one thing to be, to have an, 
in mind that you're going to be doing your marketing, you're going to be doing your merchandising, you're going to be doing your designing, you're going to be managing the supply chain as much as if you are trying to start like a, a new technology company that's an e-commerce site. You're going to be doing all of that and more and your press. Um, so there's not really a division of labor. It bleeds off into other areas that if you can't find somebody to, to manage that and oftentimes an intern coming in does not, does not have the capacity to manage that. You're often doing multiple roles. It doesn't sound like a very glamorous uh, job, but I think what's exciting about it is that it's an adrenaline kick. And if you're an adrenaline junkie uh, and you're out there actually creating something from nothing, um, it's an incredible opportunity to be able to do that. And I think that in being in the space of sustainability, a lot of the jobs that I think we'll see haven't been created yet. And I'm glad Amy brought up some of the, the material specialists because in speaking with a number of brands, I'm finding a lot of people are looking for textile specialists. They're looking for managers who speak Cantonese and Mandarin who will go out to, to China and manage their supply chain. And I think gone are the days when everybody's just looking for communications and a marketing manager and kind of doing the low touch stuff. But now it's like real hands on um, action that people are wanting because this, the t discussion of sustainability has gotten so much more serious. Um, you know, it was just like five or ten years ago now, less than that, maybe like somewhere between eight and nine. I can't remember when. Sam's Club and Walmart bought the first like organic cotton and that was like the big news in the press. Um, it's not like that anymore. It's much more complicated. The supply chains are much more, the supply chain has always been complicated, but the way that we're starting to think about sustainability is, is much more complex. Um, so naturally the jobs are going to be looking for that type of expertise. One of the pieces of research that we were doing while at Source for Style involved working with a number of universities to determine whether sourcing was taught in classrooms. And the reason why we started doing this research was because we were getting a lot of students who were interested in using Source for Style but didn't really understand how sourcing worked. So it spurred at least some questions in our mind, well, you know, are, are classrooms actually teaching students how to source? Um, we had to put that on the back burner because we were going out to raise a round of capital to grow the company. I recently took that research back up but expanded it. So it's not just on sourcing, it's do professors and schools teach sustainability in the classroom and if so, what type are they focusing on? Is it within the design class? Is it in the merchandising? Is it in the marketing? If they're not, why don't they? Is it because they can't get enough quality information? Is it the quantity information? And we started looking at both professors and student surveys. What we found is that over half of the students are learning about sustainability for the first time in the classroom. So that's like a really important thing. Most, most students are not coming in and learning about sustainability for the first, uh, or have known about sustainability for the first time until they entered into the class. And what we found out is that close to 70% of the professors want to teach more sustainability in the classroom, um, but they feel like they don't have enough quality or quantity of information um, and, and a, they don't feel comfortable enough teaching it. So I think the, the next project on the, on the radar is to be able to give all of you here today more information so that you could have better opportunity to work in the workforce. But all I have to say is I'll answer questions about entrepreneurship um, very candidly, very open, and uh, that I think that a, a lot of the jobs that are heading in this space, if you're going to be working with a company, are, are looking for um, more specialists in the trade. So, thank you.
Hello, I'm Farida. Um, I work with Suno. So Suno is a small brand. We started um, when the owner of our company, Max Osterweiss, had a collection of vintage congas, which are traditional African textiles. They usually come with a very vivid pattern, bright colors, and a border. Um, Max was raised partially in Kenya and had a collection of these that he'd been growing for about 20 years when um, the 2007 elections in Kenya erupted into violence. So when that happened, of course, um, a lot of tourism and a lot of the Kenyan economy in general um, declined, and he wanted to do something to try to bring back his second home. So he took his collection of congas and decided to make beautiful women's garments out of them. Um, a large part of our heart and a large part of our brand is still built in that love of Kenya and that desire to see its economy grow. So here we have a quote from one of our factories there, SoCo. Um, the aim of SoCo is to create sustainable, fair employment and offer training and skills to some of Kenya's poorest people. My life goal is for SoCo to remain sustainable so Yukunda can sustain. And that very much aligns with Suno's mission overall. And fortunately, we've been able to grow not only from Kenya, but we also now work in India, Peru, Turkey, Korea, and of course, we're keeping New York's garment district alive as well. Um, one of the most important aspects to our company is ensuring that we have a close personal relationship with all of the factories that we work with across the world. Um, this here is from, again, from Kenya. Um, you can see some of the traditional congas in the photo being um, manufactured. But one of the things that we are really going for is to help develop a skill here. So um, we've brought new machines in. We've helped a factory grow so that they're able to now develop silks. They've created a floor. And they have skills and um, supplies that they wouldn't have been able to create without us. So it's a very great feeling to be able to go and see the change that you're affecting in people's lives. Um, we'll send our own personal development people to help them learn how to do a blind hem, to learn how to use fusible properly, to really help develop a full fashion economy in Kenya. Um, we also work here in New York in the garment district. The, we work primarily with a factory named Johnny's. Um, in one of Johnny's missions, they hope to encourage the growth of New York's diminishing garment district and provide more employment opportunities to our community. And um, this is also a really important goal for us. We've been working with the same brand, with the same factory since our genesis five years ago. So it's really been great to be able to see that relationship grow and to see, have them help our brand grow from, you know, producing just very traditional garments to producing high-end fashions. Um, in India, our guiding philosophy is to replace the Made in India label with an honest, proudly Made in India label. And that's from Nitu Singh, who is the co-founder of Nika World, which is our primary facility there. Um, we worked very closely to find this place. We literally were scouring India for factories that we felt very comfortable working with. And we absolutely fell in love with Nitu, the owner of Nika World. Um, one of the awesome things about them also is that they do a lot of hand embroidered work and they actually have a floor that's full of men um, they have a circle of men it's a very special community that specializes in beading and embroidery we also work in peru um, the quote from one of the factory owners there is we all feel proud of our country proud about having a great artisan culture proud of the fine fibers we produce such as alpaca and pima cotton and proud to know, show the rest of the world that we can make the finest knitted garments. Um, and we work in Peru to, um, again, use sustainable and also try to be ecological. They use mostly natural dyes for their garments. And almost everything that we make there, we specialize in sweaters, is hand knitted by a small group of women. So again, it's so heartwarming to be able to go and really see the change that you're affecting in people's lives. And then this is just a little bit about the evolution of the brand. Um, first one is, again, traditional African congas from there. We've grown. Um, in the second collection pictured spring 2011, we were still very much drawing from the inspiration of those original textiles, but we kind of flipped it and made it our own. And now we've moved on to um, using more luxury materials, using silks, 
using polys, using fabrics made in Italy um, to become what we are today, but still reaching back and creating those same relationships with factories. Midget in the audience here. Um, first of all, I'm a bit. I'm Susan McPherson, and I'm. I come from a different side of the corporate responsibility, sustainability world than than these three lovely, impressive women. Um, but first, I want to see a show of hands. How many of you are actively starting to look for a job? Or you know, wow. Okay, great. Okay, good. Just make sure I'm on the right topic then. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about how I got to where I am today, and it's been a long time since I was in your shoes. Um, I'm probably the oldest person on the panel, too. And I do remember when I was actually the youngest, but it was a long time ago. <laughs> so um, where I am today, I consult in the corporate responsibility space, and the way I describe myself is I work in between, at the intersection between brands and social good. And I think it was Summer who mentioned that, uh, you know, uh, so much has happened in the last five years, but so much has happened in the last 20 years. And it used to be that brands and corporations started to do things social, with, with a social conscious because they were trying to sell more goods. Today, we are starting to see companies doing it because if they want to be around, if they want to attract any customers, they are going to be needing to do that. So what used to be potentially a nice um, value add now is a must have. So anybody looking to go into the world of corporate responsibility, social good, shared value, you now know that it is actually absolutely vital for organizations. It's not a nice to have. Um, it's also, ideally, I think what we're going to see in the next 20 years is the removal or the, the delineation or just for lack of better terms, the throwing out of such terminology as corporate social responsibility or shared value or sustainability. It is just going to be doing good business. So just some ideas that I have, have, have carried on or, or been able to um, ascertain from the work I do. So I have been for the last three and a half years working at a firm called Fenton and um, Fenton Communications. The firm's been around 32 years and it's truly a one of a kind. It has, for the last 32 years, only worked on social good, meaning only causes, campaigns, platforms that the firm has believed is in the best interest of the public. The first client was Nelson Mandela, um, which isn't a bad way to start. And over the trajectory of the history of the firm, much of the work that we did was helping the little guy or helping the nonprofit that doesn't get a lot of um, airspace or media coverage, helping them have a leg up. And it metamorphosized into helping major nonprofits, major NGOs, as well as corporations that were truly sustainable, that wanted to share their stories, share their social good, um, drive interest in the causes that they were supporting. But there are numerous consultancies out there, marketing consultancies, that do incredible work, but there aren't many, and if there are, there, there, there's very few that can only focus, or that do only focus on social good. Personally, I came from the Pacific Northwest where I was working in the corporate world, but I always had a foot or leg or hand or head in the nonprofit world. I have served on numerous boards, I volunteered, I sold cupcakes, you name it, but it was always a part of me. But my day job was in the corporate world up until about five years ago when I totally 
jumped into the corporate responsibility space. And this shows my little trek across the country. And, you know, my advice to folks coming out of school, now, from what I understand, many of you are studying design, um, fashion, um, and that's a huge area. I mean, just in the last week alone, I think I've probably spoken to seven or eight brands in the beauty space, in the, um, in, in the um, clothing space, man, uh, retail space, that are looking to figure out their, their social good plats platforms for the next few years. But for those of you looking to get into, into corporate responsibility, um, I would suggest that you figure out, you know, just immerse yourself in all of the available information that's out there. And not to overwhelm you, but what you have now at your fingertips is very different than I did 25, 30 years ago. Um, you know, you can go online, you can go on Twitter and find numerous hundreds of people that are talking about CSR. And you can connect with them. I mean, that's a beautiful thing. Um, you can be looking at things like Triple Pundit and CSR Wire and the Guardian Sustainability um, Business Hub. And you can be looking at corporations' sustainability reports, which five, ten years ago, very few American companies were publishing. Nowadays, almost all major companies and even mid-sized companies are starting to publish annual reports showing what they are doing with regards to sustainability and social good. Um, other pieces, other, you know, bits of advice. Um, I always say we have two ears and one mouth, so we should be listening twice as much as talking. And as much as when we look at the social platforms that are out there today, we tend to think of them as ways to be spreading news. They're great ways to be gathering information. And I can't tell you over the last three, four years how much I have learned from Twitter just following people, engaging with people. So in, in, the, in where you are right now, I would just absorb and talk to people. Talk to everyone you know. Talk to friends of friends. Um, because in the end, it, it's going to help you land those particular interviews, those, um, the, those coveted spots that, unlike Eileen Fisher, may not be on the company's website and you might be able to hear about from, from people that you know. Um, you're, in a beautiful, you're in an incredible city that has events like this almost every night of the week. I think the, the four panelists, we could be at events every single night, right? Um, but there are so many in the cause space because so many nonprofits are headquartered here. So I encourage you to be on the, on the look for those types of events to attend. And truly, it, it was my transition from the corporate world, in the true corporate world, into the corporate social world was because I was talking to a lot of people on and on and on and, and asking them what's important, where do you see this market going, where do you see this, this heading. Um, and this, this slide's important in the sense of discover where you fit in the corporate sustainability space. Um, a good friend of mine, Dave Stangus, he is the head of corporate responsibility for Campbell's Soup. And he, like me, is of age, and he said, although don't tell him I said that, um, he said to me a few years ago that, you know, the old time CSR people came from the operations, came from environmental sustainability. And nowadays, more people are coming from the comm side because it is so much about communicating and storytelling. Now, granted, you can't communicate and storytell when there isn't a backbone of social good happening. If there's no sustainability, you don't want somebody telling that, you know, you don't want somebody making up stories that don't exist. But in a true systemic, sustainable company, they, that company needs storytellers. They need communicators. They need people who are going to be going and bridging partnerships with the stakeholders, whether it be their employees, whether it be their customers, partners, nonprofit providers, even people who live within the communities where the companies operate. So when you look at this kind of colorful chart, see where you feel you would be able to add value. I'm not a scientist. I don't come from a logistics background. I'm more of a communicator. So for me, the natural place to, that, I, that I found myself gravitating towards was the, the, the communications, the sharing of stories, the building partnerships between nonprofits and corporations. So it's a vast space, and, and it's important to know where you want to fit. 
Um, I'm sure you hear this in all walks of life, but be authentic. Um, the, the sustainability space is very much being true to yourself and being true to the organization you work for. Um, it's all about transparency, um, and it's an industry that demands that of you as well. Of course, I'd be the cat that barked, though, anyhow. <laughs> And again, I, I can't say enough about the positives of social media. Um, I, a few years ago, had a, pardon the term, but I had a brain fart, and I decided to start a, chat, a Twitter chat that now, unfortunately, has followed me everywhere, and it's called CSR Chat. And it's every other Wednesday afternoon, although sometimes it, like we had one today because I couldn't do the one tomorrow. Um, but we have featured everything from discussions on conflict minerals to women in C CSR to corporate philanthropy to corporate guests such as um, the head of, of the sustainability departments from Microsoft, Intel, Hilton, Ritz-Carlton, um, you know, I could go on and on and on. But what it has done is, is it's created a platform on Twitter where people in the sustainability and CSR space can come and chat and discuss issues without anybody feeling afraid to ask a question because anybody can ask and we take questions from everybody. So um, it's fun. You should check it out. And uh, I don't make any money off it, so I'm not selling anything to you, but CSR chat on Twitter is fun. And that's it in terms of just overview, but I'm happy when we take questions. Thank you very much. So, um, so part of the reason that um, I wanted a diverse group here, we wanted a diverse group, is because um, I've seen this issue of specialization come up a lot. Um, you guys talk a lot about sustainability. And so when I look for work out there, I see, you know, a lot of, um, you know, the skill sets. Like when you put up the um, job posting, it said, you know, the t chemistry, all this sort of thing. And I think as international trade and marketing students, we're much more uh, focused on the logistics and the marketing, of course. And um, so, you know, Susan talks about um, the more storytelling aspect of it. And Frida has, um, I know that you, you deal with more of the ethical production. And of course, CSR deals with all sorts of different things, human rights, poverty, transparency. Diversity. Exactly. Labor relations. Exactly. So, um, you know, and I know also that, Amy, you have a degree from Green Mountain College in sustainability, and so Maureen, you have a degree in etymology from Cornell? <laughs> Environmental science. Okay. Okay. So that. obviously those those degrees help you very much in your careers dealing with sustainability. And so part of my question is um, how important is a secondary degree in that field um, for you guys? And then more of a what other kind of skills can you work on uh, in our, you know, in our major because we're in our major because we're interested in it. Um, and we can take courses on the side to do other things, but most of us aren't going to go on to do an environmental science degree. Um, so I don't know, Amy, if you want to start, uh, start out the conversation. Uh, okay. Well, at Eileen Fisher, generally speaking, um, degrees are less important. Um, we really don't look, generally speaking, for MBAs or um, advanced degrees. The only exception that I can think of is in the environmental side of things where it does help to have an advanced degree because it, it generally means you've had some work experience and some significant internships because it's, that type of work is very data and metric driven. Um, and so we really are looking for somebody who's demonstrated the ability to gather, analyze, and communicate data, translate data and communicate it. And um, oftentimes it goes hand in hand with an advanced degree, but with the other aspects of my, my team and others in the company that, that have um, tentacles into <laughs> social consciousness, um, it's much more about the experience that they have and, um, and their personality and culture fit. I have uh, recently spoken to uh, Jason Kibbe, who is the executive director of our Sustainable Apparel Coalition, which I know Amy mentioned. And the Sustainable Apparel Coalition, for those of you who might not know, 
represents about a third of the apparel and footwear market and it's looking to create and get out the hig index which is an internal right now an internal tool to look at sustainability metrics and methodologies for for footwear and apparel companies and I asked him where he felt the skill set was going to need to be in the next you know now until the next 10 years and he felt pretty strongly that you will still need the skill set of whether you're coming out and designing or merchandising or marketing but you will have need to have a basic understanding and um, for sustainability in mind like if you're a designer and you're going to go into Nike um, you're going to need to use and figure out how to do the, the tools and, it, and it's something that you could probably learn there but it's it, in coming into the um, I think that it would, you'd be a much more impressive candidate coming in with that knowledge and that uh, uh, consciousness in mind um, one of the things that I've often looked for in since I've run all the the intern and employee programs when running my own company um, I've always looked for people with great analytical and research skills and the reason for that is um, it's nice to know people are able to figure things out uh, <laughs> on their own that they're not necessarily as somebody who's often kind of out doing meetings and running companies you 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 can't always rely on somebody for the answers like I'm not always going to be there for the answers and so I've always liked bringing on people who could almost self-manage themselves or be able to figure out something without having to call or email every 15 minutes so people who are able to actually have a, a, a great research analytical skills um, be able to figure things out on their own um, feel a sense of independence while still being a team worker I think are all kind of softer skill sets um, that the team worker and the organization side are like softer skill sets that I often uh, often look for um, anybody who's ever applied for a position uh, within my consulting firm or within source for style will know that it's like uh, a five page <laughs> um, a five page um, uh, uh, application that you need to fill out and the only reason for that is to see what people actually take the time um, and are serious about applying it's actually a test um, for those who don't want to take the time um, they've weeded themselves out already <laughs> and I think that in in working in a position where it's a more enterprising position where you're going to need to work later hours or be extremely passionate and be up um, uh, doing jo like jobs that you might have never seen yourself but have the uh, extreme pleasure in, in building things from scratch uh, we need to have those those people on set who are able to um, um, think on their feet, solve things on their own, and and do things that they normally didn't think that they were going to do. So, like common sense is the most important thing, basically. Yeah, and common sense, analytical skills, thinking on your feet, and being willing to put in the the hard hours. Okay, is your interview process as strenuous as your application form? The the <laughs> interview is less strenuous because a lot of the a lot of the questions on the application form are what people would normally ask in an interview and um, and so it's 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 weeding out a lot of um, a lot of the of the people who wouldn't take the time yeah <laughs> okay great did you want to add? Um, so I actually don't come from a fashion background I went to college for um, psychology and medicine and found myself very passionate and drawn to fashion um, so I would say in my industry and in, you know in production it's not necessarily um, a prerequisite to have a degree in fashion but it does help to be passionate about what you're doing um, for me I've had to learn a lot of the international trade agreements to know you know exactly how to deal with getting things into and out of Korea out of um, Korea out of Kenya how to work with the governments um, what things are and aren't legal for us to do I had to get a good 
understanding of HTS codes. And there's a lot of very logistical things um, that I had to master. I use a lot of Excel. I work with a lot of numbers. For us, those are skills that we definitely like look for when we're um, interviewing candidates and looking at interns also. And like Summer mentioned, analytical skills are always a plus, I think, in almost any field that you go into. And I am the opposite of, or anti-analytical anything. Um, and my undergraduate and, and graduate degrees were history, political science, and then journalism. So, um, I, you know, w am I applying those today? No, but I grew up in a household with a father who was a professor who said you went to college to learn. That's it. You went to college to educate yourself. You didn't. You don't go to college to get a job. But again, this was many, many moons ago. But my advice when I meet with um, folks coming out of college or coming out of graduate school is take advantage of internships. Um, again, we live in a city here, and if many of you, if, if, for those of you who do live here, there are so many corporations that are looking for millennial minds, um, either as a, as a junior staffer or as an intern. And I always, in, in terms of, of, of CSR and sustainability type positions, um, I always suggest to people, instead of looking for actual postings, is find companies that you are passionate about or find organizations that you are passionate about and sell yourself to the organization, whether as an intern or as a junior staffer, and tell them what you can bring to them. What value can you add to them? And again, since this field, there's not like a, a manual that we're all following. And we, those of us who work in this field are learning from others. So if somebody came to me with that, I'd be like, hey, yeah, I'll figure out a way to get you on board. But I would suggest more important than more and more degrees, at least for the work that we all do, experience is hugely, hugely helpful. Can I just add something? Of course. One of the things that I've always appreciated, and I think that sometimes coming into um, a workplace and being a new person, um, you tend not to do this, but I love working with people who have an opinion. And I, <laughs> I, I really do. I think that um, when a lot of people are looking for a job and are, are coming into the space, whether they're coming in as an intern or they're doing an externship or they're coming in as a new employee, there's something to be said with people who take the initiative to do something. And even if something they do something wrong, I almost feel that it's, and this is my personal opinion, I don't know how anybody else feels, I almost feel like that if they've attempted to actually do something and take the initiative, I've, I would have rather seen that rather than not done it at all. And, um, and just to give a side story, I, did, I hired the wrong person over the summer um, and, uh, and eventually it, it was, I had to let him go. Um, but, you know, he did the application. It was really good. It was somebody from who couldn't actually come in for an interview. And, uh, and this is a, a case that my, my interview process didn't really go as well as I wanted it to. But um, he had just no opinion through the whole time. And uh, even when I asked him something or gave him an opportunity to take an initiative elsewhere, he turned it down. And, and that dismayed me because I, I really think that in coming into a space, if you, were, if you want to make it work and you want to grow within that company, or even if you don't want to grow in that company and you want to grow um, and, and, and with another company, it really is uh, wonderful to be able to put yourself out there, um, say what you believe and say what you think, and then have a conversation about it with the, the other employees or the other colleagues that you're working with. I think, I think for students, it is hard to get into that space mm -hmm. of thinking that we can just, you know, go ahead and say what we think about things. Um, we're used to being in classes and having, you know, uh, being taught at. And so, um, you know, I guess something that I'd like to know about is um, having different backgrounds as you guys do. Um, obviously, it's different with small companies as opposed to larger companies, nonprofits uh, versus for profits. And if someone were interested in, you know, really having a diff making a difference in the world, you know, uh, getting into CSR in general, what kind of, um, you know, what are the differences between those in terms of uh, opportunities, in terms of uh, company culture? You know, when I was looking for an internship, 
Uh, I was offered a lot of large companies, and I was looking for smaller ones, and it was hard to navigate that space between them. And so a lot of us are trying to figure that out. So, um, you know, with all of your different uh, experiences, and from the very small companies to very large companies, I'd like to hear a little bit about that. Um, I I would say it's more about the actual what the internship is as opposed to the organization, at least in my experiences. Um, you know, and again, a long time ago, you know, I, I interned for McNeil Lair News Hour, which is now the PBS News Hour. I interned for Senator Kennedy in Washington. Um, these were all, um, both of those were amazing places. Both internships were very different, but it's, when you're looking at an internship, you know, make sure you find out what is the expectations, what does success look like. And I think, if anything, yes, the, the size of the organization matters, but I think that the, the position and what tasks you'll be asked to do and what expectations are put on you is probably, to me, a more important decision or delineator. Mm -hmm. Than that, the size of a company. Is that specifically for internships? Yeah. What about yeah. for for you know uh, students graduating? Maybe they already have some internship experience. They're kind of looking to yeah. figure out where they belong in that world. I don't know if it's a different situation. I I I think you have to decide on it's it's like trying to choose your college and see right. what it's culture you you fit in and some of you would say hey you know this fits my culture i want to be in an urban center and mm -hmm. be able to party on the weekends and all this other kind of stuff and others will just be like i want to like be in a very small college so i know everybody and i want to be in a a giant state college and and you all have reasons for that um, from from my experience, and, and this is, I guess, my experience always working within kind of a startup mentality, um, but working also closely with, with um, brands in big space, like Payless Shoe Source and Collective right. Brands, where they have 3,000 employees in their middle, Topeka, between like <laughs> a burrito factory and a women's penitentiary. Like, you know, there's, it's a completely different culture. And what I've heard from people who have worked with me and worked in very similar spaces is like, wow, you know, working with you, I could do so many different things. And I'm not just, you know, getting coffee and doing menial labor and like as a start, as a start. And I think that you kind of have to determine, and when you're applying into positions, you are applying to the culture of a company. And you, you are more likely to probably be very hands-on, and again, this is a general assumption, you're more likely to be more hands-on in a startup or a smaller company than you are within a larger company. Yeah. Um, and larger companies, whether we like it or not, they get cumbersome. Like, Decisions have to be made through multiple parties. Um, you might have tons of meetings. Um, you know, there's, I've felt that you just haven't been able to get as much, you know, work done when you are in like an exciting kind of entrepreneurial, um, smaller startup where you're expected to do work that you may have never probably get a chance to even do. Um, when you're in a giant corporate setting. Mm -hmm. So I think, and, and, and honestly, that giant corporate setting might be something that you guys are interested in. I'm obviously very biased and partial, <laughs> but um, you might want to have um, a life outside of your passion. You might want to uh, go in at a specific hour and be expected to clock out at a certain hour. Um, it doesn't mean that you can't, like, be passionate about your job, but there's oftentimes like you might have family, you might have, um, you know, interest in kind of going and volunteering within the community, and you want to have time to be out of that. Um, I just feel like you, it's like applying to another university and trying to find that culture that you fit in and what you expect. In I Amy, kind of rambled, do you want to defend that? <laughs> Um, well, yes, I do think that our larger company is very exciting um, and very entrepreneurial within, within the walls of the company. But having said that, um, some things that occur to me um, about people who uh, come looking for a job with us, um, we are highly competitive. We get about 10,000 resumes a year for what end up being about 50 or 60 jobs, including our retail stores. So um, what ends up happening is that we really do have a, the, our choice of a lot of really talented people. And um, 
I've noticed that people who call ahead and take the initiative and set up an informational interview, either before they've actually applied for a role or after they've applied, um, I, this just happened a month ago actually, somebody applied for a role in a different team and then saw my name on LinkedIn, I can't tell you how useful LinkedIn is, I'm, I'm not suggesting everybody contact each of us that way, but um, <laughs> it, it, it does work and she called me, I had a conversation with her, I really liked her on the telephone um, and I went back to HR and I said, I know she applied for such and such a role, I think you should pull her resume out and interview her and they did. So um, that kind of thing is really, really helpful. Um, it also allows us to flag your resume for the future if there isn't a good fit now. But the other thing I tell people is for anybody who's particularly interested in working in my team, and we're a really small team, we're really interested in having people throughout the company who have these values. So if you happen to have a sales background and you're, you're trying to make a career switch and get into a CSR job, for example, my advice is, we have really great sales jobs that need people with CSR values, and I think you should really play to market yourself in a way that, that allows you to shine, um, um, play up to your skills, play up to your experience. So um, those are some of the things that occur to me. Um, there was another thing, and I can't remember it. When I remember it, I'll, I'll talk about it. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that it's important to note that, you know, it's not like everyone's going to go out and say, oh, here's a CSR job, I'm going to get this CSR job. You can work within other companies, you know, in various different departments and have those values and espouse those values and, you know, look for openings to come up with. And in a larger company, you'd have those opportunities. Well, and task forces in very large companies where they are the, – the, CSR department is trying to break out of a silo. They're looking for champions throughout the corporation that are going to be – taking the message out to customers, taking the message out to partners and resellers. So I think you raised great points, Amy. Yeah, that was one of the things that we, we did at uh, Payless as well. 3,000 employees, they had um, a little sustainability department, but we ended up assembling a sustainability task force and, um, and working with them on like, how do we get people from the HR department? How do we get people from the merchandising department? How do we get people from the energy department within the whole system to be involved within that task force itself? So again, it was, it was a very nascent aspect to um, pay less because that they weren't, it's a 50 year old company. They're not necessarily based in sustainability. It wasn't their one of their core founding principles but it was something that they're looking to kind of starting start to bake in and um, and find people within that uh, uh, corporate system to be able to do that. So again, kind of looking out in in interest, you know, what are the companies that are now starting to do this that you might be able to grow within and kind of transfer with, whether it's in the sustainability task force and it's not necessarily within the core C CSR department. All right, well, I think that um, we should see if we have any questions from the audience. Um, <laughs> we have them right, right down here. I don't know who's closest, Annabelle or Julian. Yep, here he comes. <laughs> see, I couldn't do that right now with my boot. Hello, uh, my name is Nana, and I'm also part of the CSR club. Um, and I had a few questions, but I'm going to try my best to keep it short. Um, first question is for you, Nadia. I actually had a, not to sound strange, but I had a business model to source clothing in different countries that are third world and kind of start setting up factories from the scratch and making sure they're sustainable and um, source everything very ethnically um, with li living va wages and so on. So my question would be, um, exactly as you, your company is doing, you guys are using the Kenyan fabrics and inspire, uh, putting them into European designs. Now, A, how are the sales going? And B, do you ever go, uh, encounter yourself with political issues in those countries? And because they're developing countries, having corruption um, is a big issue, I know. So how do you control the corruption aspect and the political um, relationships among the U.S. and the Kenyan government? Um, one, our sales are going great. <laughs> um, we've grown a lot, like I was saying, from um, the traditional congas. We've now expanded. We get a lot of fabrics from Italy, so we're doing silks. 
um, we're doing rayons, we're doing viscose. So we have really grown our brand beyond our initial vision. Um, it has been very difficult to work with certain governments and to work within certain compliances, but um, when you find systems that work for you, like we personally are very respectful of Verite compliance, and um, so they basically go in and inspect the factories, make sure that everyone is getting proper wages, make sure that they're living, that they're working in um, fair conditions, and then we go in and inspect them also. So like in India, for instance, every worker has to have a fan like cooling them down if there's no central air. Um, in Kenya, they have to have running water like for the restroom. They can't just have you know like a hole in the wall in the ground, which literally <laughs> happens. Um, so for us, it's about one making sure that everyone is living up to the standards that we would expect them to have here, and then it's also about us going, visiting, seeing how their working conditions are, like staying with them for a full day, showing up unannounced, and just like making sure everything is going as well as it can. Um, in Kenya especially, it's been very difficult to work with their government. They have AGOA and they have TRIO, which are two treaties that are set up to help us get goods in and out duty free. But a lot of the times the government is very suspicious of brands and they want to like know exactly where every penny is going. You have to have um, documents verifying everything that comes in and goes out. So let's say we, you know, import 50 pounds of fabric and we only ship out 45 and they want to know what happened to that extra five pounds. So for us it's just about making sure that we're finding ways to recycle those fabrics, making sure that all of our documents line up and then we do have one person on the ground in Kenya that also helps us like legalize all of our paperwork. So you have to be really um, committed to working with certain countries and make sure that you are being compliant yourself, that you know all of the rules yourself and then also make sure that you have people working with you and for you on the ground that can help you get everything through. So in terms of the, um, you know, dealing with the politics over there, um, dealing with the auditing, is that all mostly outsourced or do you guys spend a lot of time doing that yourselves? No, we spend a lot of time doing that ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's a constant, it's a constant process. Like we started the company in 2008 and even now we're still dealing with some things that, you know, were from the genesis of our company. So it's one of those things where you really have to like, make sure that you have everything on the books and easy to access at a second's notice. So. If you need to speak into the microphone. Yeah. Oh, you asked if our, if our company is the one that's sponsoring the factories. Um, for the most part, we work with factories that are also working with other brands. So in our um, largest factory, which is Viva Africa, we have our own personal floor there. So we have, um, basically like a large room that's dedicated only to us. We have about 15 machines there. We have about 20 tailors that are like going around inspecting, working on our garments exclusively. But they also produce for ASOS. They also produce the feed bags. They also produce for Eden. So there are companies that um, we don't necessarily, we aren't necessarily the only brand there, but we are encouraging other brands to work there. So like Viva Africa was working with Eden prior to us coming in, but now that we've been there, they see their capabilities, they're using more silks, they're using more high-end textiles with the same factory. I just want to remind everyone that we have an online audience and they can only hear us if we speak into the mic. So if someone asks a question without a mic, we would like the moderator to repeat the question. Thank you. Any other questions? Gentlemen up there. Hi, how's everyone doing? I'm Leslie Francis, and uh, I have a question in terms of fashion product development. So, I know where you're coming up with new styles. Some of you have mentioned, not just the traditional. So I wanted to know, who are your pattern makers? Are they local people, or do you have individuals who go in and train them in the arts of pattern making, in terms of producing your clothing? So I'm just keeping it open to anyone who could answer that. Uh, well, our pattern makers are local to our company which is in Westchester and um, they are highly skilled. In fact, we have been recognizing that the the fine art of pattern making and um, some of the other skills found in product development are dying out and they have been training other people in the company um, who are just interested in learning these things. They've set up classes to teach other people in the company. So um, I don't know if that answers your question, but yes. Okay. Um, 
I guess we employ something kind of similar. Most of our samples are made here in New York, so a lot of our pattern work is done either in our sampling room, but we're also beginning to transition. We have one in-house pattern maker that we're working much more closely with now. Okay, we have another question up there. Annabelle? Hi, um, I'm an ITM major, and I also was part of the CSR club. And I have to say, I know a lot of us are seniors, and we're worried about the entry-level positions. Um, I don't want employers to underestimate us because we're coming from a fashion school and we do have a very strong business degree. And I just want to know what outlets or what niches to get into first to get into CSR because I know that they want people with more experience, but you know, we can only do so many internships, we can only do so many things for free, and we are graduating, so we want to get right into it. And I want to know what is probably an easier to get into entry level job that will be a better um, way for us to then get into a higher level CSR position. Especially like I'm interested in bigger companies. Um, so in terms of that. Um, <clears throat> uh, just based on what I know through my own company and a few colleagues at other companies, you know, the CSR roles and sales are really, there aren't that many of them, um, frankly, compared to other just other roles and companies. And so, um, like I was saying earlier, I really do encourage people to think more broadly than just CSR. But, but having said that, um, uh, I also encourage people to really be open to, to doing whatever is needed in, in those entry level jobs because you need to show what you can do and you need to um, explore all avenues um, available to you within whatever role is that you end up taking in, a, in an entry level job. I mean, I did it, um, many people in, in my company have done that and when you've kind of displayed your, your various skills and talents, people will pick up on that and will want to grab you for their team or um, invite you in for a special project or something like that. So. Um, I wouldn't look at a new job as the, the one that you're going to be in, you know, for the next five or ten years. Really look at it as a, as a way to get in the door and to experience the company culture and to get to know people and, and, um, and really start uh, feeling your way around. So um, I think there are lots of jobs within any company, and I, somebody mentioned this earlier tonight, to find the company that whose values really resonate with yours, and that to me would be the best thing that you can do. And then the actual role itself is almost is secondary, because you want to enjoy going to work, and you want to have fun with the people that you're there with for eight or ten hours a day. Anyone else? No? All right. Uh, we have up there. Yeah. Um. My name is Romina Sobraj. I'm an international trade student here at FIT. My question is for Summer Oaks, and I wanted to know what exactly, what marketing steps and techniques your company makes in order to alert and show the community and the trade how sustainable your company actually is. Um, are you referring to Source for Style or are you referring to Good Eggs? now source for style okay um, well I've been I've been out of source for style for a, a while so it's very difficult to um, to speak to it because the uh, emphasis on sustainability has not been as large as when I was a part of it um, because it was very much my my personal mo so if you actually go to source for style now it's very much hidden in the mission you would just see it through the materials. So and I think that was a, a role or a decision that was made by the board and, and uh, by my business partner. And it was something that we kind of discussed early on where, whereby we wanted to attract people beyond um, designers who are focused on sustainability and we, we were thinking of like having it as Susan had mentioned, it's just like it's just doing good business. Um, but a lot of that language and a lot of the editorial content and everything is, is not currently there anymore. I can speak when, um, when we were doing it uh, for, for two and a half years, we made a huge emphasis on being able to educate the, the community. 
And we did that through uh, a lot of, of writing and, and speaking. So we had an extensive blog where we talked about sustainability. We taught people how to source more sustainably. We did uh, interviews with uh, a number of brand professionals that we thought were leaders and trendsetters within the space. Um, we had uh, discussions of how to showcase sustainable materials, whether it was pre preservation of craft, um, that was a huge aspect of our site, whether it was recycled or upcycled materials, whether it was more environmentally preferable, so say for instance an organic cotton versus conventional cotton, uh, a rain-fed cotton versus irrigated, and there were specific uh, icons for people to be able to, to sh uh, see what those material aspects were. So it, it very much baked into the, the core of the company and visibly so from the, the point of educating the, the consumer or the buyer. Um, also from the aspect of sourcing, so right now Source for Style has about 5,000 materials. We're catering to designers in about 75 countries and um, we source from suppliers in about 32 countries around the world. So it's, it's quite global. Um, but I, I wish I could speak more eloquently about how it's being pushed across right now, but I know when you go to the, to the website, it, it, it's, not as, it's not as visibly so. It's just it's more baked into the principles of the company at this point. I, I think that speaks also to what you were saying about having people who can do their research um, and people who can communicate, like Susan was talking about, because obviously you need a lot of people to write. Yeah. write on these blogs and do the research. Um, yeah, and we brought on a lot of writers who had very analytical skills. We used a lot of people from FIT, actually. Um, one, I was just telling Amy, went over and worked, started working with, uh, with uh, Eileen Fisher. <laughs> right. um, and, and that, uh, for me, on a personal level from, from being in this space, I am very much a communicator, and I think that it always needs to be said, and it's just that the, the way that we say it needs to change over the course of the, of the year. I think that when you're running a startup, things have to get, you have to give and take, and the time and effort that you're putting into communication takes away from running the operations of a company. And, uh, and when you're running a very small um, startup and you raise only a small round of capital, um, things, you, you begin to realize that you have to make very hard decisions. And, um, and I think that's something to be said for people who are saying, oh, I, I can't work with any company because nothing speaks to my culture or vision and you want to go out and start your own. Yeah, I think that starting out on your own is, is difficult and you're going to have to make a lot of decisions and you might want to start small. Like for your, your idea, for instance, you might want to start with um, working with a factory that's already on the ground and, and learning about that and then starting in within one region or one country and then building out from there and not trying to take on too much. There's a common phrase that people use within the space and it's like most companies die of bloat rather than um, having that kind of um, focus and when you're trying to take on too much under, under one roof. Start small, learn how to write, basically. Right. Okay. Um, so, do we have any other questions? Um, well, up here. I have a two-part question for the representative from Eileen Fisher. Fisher. Uh, part one is regarding your company policy in the U.S., and part two is regarding your company policy overseas. And in the U.S., who is Eileen, F Eileen F Fisher, and um, are your internship, uh, internships paid? Who is Eileen Fisher? Yes. There's a real woman named Eileen Fisher. Mm -hmm. She's still connected to the company. She's our chief creative officer. Uh, do you need to know more than that? She's the founder. <laughs> um, our internships are paid, yes. And the second, question, uh, second part of the question is regarding China, productions in China, since you mentioned that uh, in your presentation that 60 percent of your production is made in China. Is that correct? It's actually closer to 80 percent. 80 percent. 
So how closely are you, um, do you monitor working conditions in China, in your factories in China? We, we, we have very close monitoring of our manufacturers. The, um, we only use seven factories. Um, about 75, it's about 75 to 80 percent of our product is made in China in seven factories. And those seven factories we've been with for a very long time. We know them very well. We have, um, our, our manufacturing team is there frequently, and we also have our sourcing agent there frequently, plus we have NGO partnerships that visit those factories for training programs with the workers, the managers. It's very, um, I would say, rigorous and deeply developed relation, set of relationships there. Okay. If I can just add, Eileen Fisher is not, it, 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 you're not this massive behemoth like Gap or, you know, so it's, it's actually, you are able to monitor the conditions that are, that are out there. Okay. Is it job related? It seems that I'm being cut off, so I, I hope not. But anyway, um, the last question is, um, because everybody seems to be committed to, you know, working conditions and human rights and all that, would a company like Highland Fisher, a $400 million company, be committed to issues like that, particularly in China, um, with regard to human rights? Would the company be willing to participate or even initiate a conversation regard, regarding human rights in China. Is it, so this is a, a, a discussion about careers for students. Um, and uh, your questions are, are wonderful and extremely valid, but I would like to just try to get on track. I don't know if you have a question about um, more aligned with careers in the, in the industry, but um, we're just gonna move on to the next, sorry. Next question. Over here. Hi, my name is Allison. Um, so obviously, as we, it was just touched on, retail has become like a sink or swim industry given the addition of um, CSR. And we definitely have a future, as we discussed, all of you discussed, um, with small companies having um, CSR kind of embody um, the company and then it can expand from there. However, how promising do you foresee um, CSR being and evolving from just a sector of a large-scale company to the entire infrastructure? So someone just talked about GAP. Um, obviously, it's harder to monitor such like a large-scale um, international brand. Do you foresee it evolving just from a sector to the entire, like affecting the entire company? Um, yeah. <laughs> Well, definitely it's happening already in our company, and I would say there are many, um, many companies where this, is, where this is happening, where it's really becoming integrated throughout all roles in the company on some level. That's what I was talking about earlier around um, you don't have to be within the CSR team to carry out those values and embody those values. They really exist in almost every role in our company to some degree. And um, my experience is that it's more typical in the smaller companies right now, um, privately owned, because they have more control over um, um, how, they, how they embody their values. Um, maybe you guys, what is it? Yeah, I think um, there's a move of not calling reports and businesses CSR reports, but more integrative reporting. And that particularly means that sustainability has to be seen throughout the company and is it you know financially sustainable is it more environmentally sustainable is it social socially sustainable so I feel as if there's a number of companies now moving away as you had mentioned away from that whole CSR vertical and saying okay how, how could this be more integrated I mean additionally within the apparel industry um, you know, we would have never seen something like the Sustainable Apparel Coalition 10 years ago. And this is a very collaborative, open source um, organization. I guess it's considered a trade organization now, right? Yes. SAC? Yeah. I mean, it's a trade organization that represents 33% of the apparel and footwear market. And that's no longer a trend. I mean, and most of this stuff is happening behind the scenes. So as, as people who aren't within the companies themselves and are seeing it more from a, a consumer's perspective, um, we're seeing something that's underfoot 
that might not be apparent to you right now. So I do encourage kind of looking at the company as a whole, um, taking a look at what Susan said earlier, what their values and their ethos is. You could easily see it from their integrated reporting or their CSR reports online, um, and and be more involved. This is not a trend any longer. It, it really isn't, um, and it's and it's the way that kind of the course is moving. And I think a lot of companies really struggle. I mean, I, I talked to Kevin Mayette, who is the head of sustainability at REI, and um, they had some um, sea level changes there. So he was, he was uh, either left or let go. And, uh, and I really look up to him for, for great advice. I think he's an awesome, an awesome guy. And he said, you know, I met some of the folks at H&M. Here you have this very conflicted company who is one of the biggest like fast fashion companies out there and he said their sustainability people are some of the best that I've met and they have this real internal conflict of you know how are we doing this quick response you know they got lambasted of course and, and remember the New York Times piece like not even a year ago where they're like slicing up their outfits and throwing them out to um, the waste piles and you know they did some course correction with that and I think that sometimes those companies are some of the most interesting to work with because there's so much of the internal struggle there and in, in coming into one of those large companies and expressing what you're interested in, you might find yourself working on some really big change at the, the forefront of the industry. And I just, you know, don't overlook or underestimate the fact that as millennials and the age that you are, you bring so much knowledge and information to companies, okay? And, and you've got you've to be confident about that. And I'm around people all the time that are sitting around saying, gee, what, what, what are the millennials going to be doing? And it's like we all sit around going, ah, oh. <laughs> you know. But, but if you have youth in your favor, okay, so use that. It is not a negative at all. And maybe I'm looking at look through rose-colored glasses, but truly, there are just, it, it's a tough job market, but if you are astute, if you are research-friendly, if you have an open mind, there are going to be numerous opportunities in all facets of this, of this industry that, that we all work in and, and, and love. And, and just like, it's just like college, but on like a bigger <laughs> scale, you have to immerse yourself in it to feel as if you could take hold. I, mean, I know it seems like this Pandora's box that you're not even sure how to open um, yet, but it, it's about putting yourself into that position and, and starting from there. It's, it's, it's very scary and, um, and you feel like you might make the wrong decision and you're going to be stuck with it for like 10 years of your life, but it's not like that. It's about immersing yourself in the culture getting to be a part of it and analyzing it from there and and um, you know I just I, I it's 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 scary and I know it's more scary I think now than you know when I got out of college um, but it, it's it's the same principles you go in and as soon as you're in it's like that first day of school where you're just like I don't ha I don't know anybody and my roommate is I don't even know who my roommate is, and what friends am I going to make, and will I even like my professors? And you and you get over it. You, you're comfortable now, and it's it's the same thing that happens. It's like a bigger college. <laughs> Very cool. So um, I think we might have time for one really quick question, maybe right down here, and then we got to wrap it up. Hi, my name is Claire. I'm also an ITM major and president of the Entrepreneurship Club here at FIT. And communication has been such a theme of tonight's panel discussion. And I wonder if any of you have a second language, but also more importantly from my past experience internationally, how cross-cultural communications plays into your, your careers and your everyday jobs. I was a language major, undergrad, Chinese, and um, also had studied a great deal of Spanish, and those were the two languages that were most important when I started developing the human rights work in our company 15 years ago, and um, because of our supply chain. So that was tremendous for us, and it really, even though my language skills have diminished greatly since I graduated from college a really long time ago, um, it just helped 
put people at ease and it makes gives gives a you know provides a, a level of connection personal connection even if I end up having to rely on an interpreter or English even um, when I'm visiting with suppliers so um, it's huge and in fact when we hired um, our human rights person who was up on the screen there earlier we specified at that time that we needed somebody who spoke Chinese because um, because of the amount of production we do there and our New York um, most of our US manufacturers are Chinese speaking as well so really really helpful and um, we re just now hired a, a half-time um, like a consultant person in India who speaks local Indian languages um, for that precise reason it's really really important for us anyone else Hablaba yeah. español por cuatro años, pero lo dejé por ocho años ahora. Um, the language was and has been was, and will continue to be an incredible aspect that we were looking for for Sorcerer Style. Um, and, uh, and I had the benefit of having a founder who spoke um, three languages fairly well. Uh, Spanish, French, and um, and uh, Hindi, and in working with 30 some countries, uh, it was extremely helpful. And we had discussed multiple times having um, particularly uh, particular people on the ground who are just sourcing suppliers to be able to ramp them up on the site, and fashion and most businesses, but particularly fashion is incredibly global and when you're looking at the sourcing side of things I mean manufacturing might happen particularly for small brands um, primarily within the states or close to home but as you start to radiate outwards um, and particularly sourcing materials you're going to be sourcing them from abroad uh, and being able to be immersed within that culture be able to speak the language uh, and also technical language um, is is extremely important. All right, great, thanks. Um, fortunately, we don't have any time for any more questions, but I want to thank everyone for coming again. It was a wonderful talk. And um, <laughs> so you guys know, the CSR Club meets every Thursday in room A6343 at 1 p.m. So come on by if you want to. Thanks and I'm just going to have uh, Christine pictures. We're going to have pictures. Thanks, everybody. Okay.